Kenneth Hewish. Mr Speaker, you haven't called question time yet. OK, I call question time. Mr Speaker, um, my question is to the Police Minister. I refer to the deeply tragic death of Annalise Eugel and your comments in the following days that you will review the way police bail operates. And I ask, do you support the family's request for an Annalise Eugel law to stop those accused of child sex offences obtaining police bail? Minister. That's a matter that uh, I have uh, sought further advice from West Australian Police from, that I've had discussions uh, with senior police about, and that I continue to have discussions with our Attorney General about. Supplementary. Minister, will you now join the Liberal Party and convince your Cabinet colleagues to support an Annalise, an Annalise Eugel law to prevent a terrible tragedy like this from happening again? Minister. I'm well aware of the, the heartache that that family has experienced. Um, I'm also aware that there will likely be a coronial inquest. Um, I think it's appropriate uh, that we deal with this in a considered way and one that benefits uh, not just Annalise's family but other families who may go through similar trauma. This has been a deeply traumatic thing for so many in the community. I appreciate that. Uh, as you well know, uh, there is no time to introduce new laws this year, and I think it's appropriate that we put the best possible measures in place, that we give those measures proper consideration, uh, and that's what we will do on behalf of the whole community. Thank you, Minister. The Minister, uh, Member for Kingsley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I refer to the recent community outbreak of COVID-19 in South Australia and I ask, can the Premier update the House on the swift action taken by the West Australian Government in responding to this outbreak and outline how this will keep our state safe and strong? Premier. Uh, can I thank the member for Kingsley for the question? Uh, obviously, uh, the outbreak of community spread of the virus in South, South Australia remains very concerning. Uh, today, South Australia has reported at least four uh, new uh, cases, and it may be more. Uh, and whilst that is still a uh, small number, we know how insidious this virus can be uh, and how it can spread uh, so easily. Uh, Mr Speaker, we'll continue to monitor the situation to uh, determine the true extent of the outbreak. Uh, but the, uh, the truth of the matter is we're taking this matter very, very seriously. Uh, we've acted uh, very swiftly. Firstly, uh, we've acted to uh, go to a hard border with South Australia uh, with a very limited list of exemptions for people to come in uh, through uh, South Australia into Western Australia. Uh, this decision was taken based upon health advice from the Chief Health Officer, and I'll table that advice. I think we received this advice uh, yesterday, Mr Speaker, uh, which detailed uh, what we needed to do and why we needed to, needed to do it, Mr Speaker. South Australia has now gone from a very low risk uh, and, catapulted to, and catapulted to a medium risk uh, category, Mr Speaker, and that limits the number of people uh, and the range of people who can come in to Western Australia uh, via South Australia, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, these measures obviously are harsh and they are difficult for people to manage, particularly people uh, who uh, wanted to come in for a range of reasons, Mr Speaker, and they will mean significant delays on people who are in South Australia uh, coming uh, to Western Australia, if they can come uh, at all. Uh, but we are doing this based upon health advice in order to protect the health uh, of uh, West Australians. My, I urge any West Australians who are currently in South Australia to come home now, uh, and they will be required to quarantine uh, and uh, be tested, Mr Speaker. The flow of arrivals from South Australia has slowed down uh, very dramatically as a result of the actions uh, we have taken. Uh, and as I said, uh, we know that the uh, measure that we have put in place uh, actually works. Now, I want to say a few uh, other things, Mr Speaker. Firstly, can I congratulate the Premier of South Australia, Stephen Marshall, uh, who I have a very good working relationship with, uh, for uh, the measures he has taken uh, to uh, uh, close down certain activity in Adelaide uh, to protect the health of the people uh, of Adelaide, Mr Speaker. Uh, obviously, that has been a uh, pretty dramatic step, uh, but I think is appropriate in the circumstances what he has done, and I congratulate him on doing that. And I also congratulate the state opposition uh, in uh, South Australia for joining and supporting 
uh, the state government in South Australia in what they've had to do. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, secondly, I want to make this point. I've seen reports in Western Australia of panic buying, uh, once again of toilet paper. I'd urge people not to do stupid and dumb things like that. Uh, please don't engage in panic buying in Western Australia. There is absolutely no need for people to do this. I just urge everyone to be sensible and reasonable. Uh, we have no cases reported in Western Australia and we have gone to a hard border to protect the people uh, of this state, Mr Speaker. Uh, and thirdly, I just want to make the point, borders work. They are constitutional. The Commonwealth, has, uh, the Commonwealth High Court uh, has endorsed uh, the legality of these. The Federal Court examined the issues and said that this was a very effective tool to stop the spread of COVID. Uh, if only the United States, another federation made up of states, uh, had engaged in this sort of practice, maybe they wouldn't have the terrible situation uh, that they have currently uh, in uh, the United States. If Britain, which is an island, had engaged in even an international border, it might now be in a far better position uh, than it currently is. I'd urge all those people out there bemoaning and complaining the measures the West Australian government is taking uh, to stop and understand that this government will take whatever measures we deem fit to protect the health and welfare of the people of this state, and we won't be stopped or criticised uh, by people over east who don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. The member for Bateman. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, I note the New South Wales government's announcement for the abolition of stamp duty, and I ask, why is the WA Labor government not engaged in any tax or other economic reforms as part of the COVID recovery plan to deliver growth in the WA economy and local jobs? Treasurer. Mr Speaker, we did. We lifted the threshold for payroll tax uh, to the highest level. We brought, brought forward a legislated scheduled increase in payroll tax from the 1st of January next year to the 1st of July this year, the threshold, uh, which has been a very good reform and it was welcomed wholeheartedly by those who pay payroll tax and that no longer do uh, pay payroll tax as a result of our decision. I think some 17,500 businesses uh, are lifted from the payroll tax burden as a result of that decision. Of course, there was a significant rebate given, of course, in respect of payroll tax, uh, as well as a range of other support from the business sector uh, that will continue to do. And I do note um, the announcement of the New South Wales government, subject, of course, to the federal government support, uh, which I've noted in all the meetings I've had with Commonwealth Treasury uh, and other treasurers that the Commonwealth is certainly not interested in providing that support. Supplementary members. Those were announced prior to COVID, and why is your government not providing long-term small business uh, long-term tax relief for small businesses to deliver a stronger economic recovery from the COVID crisis? Mr. Speaker, Treasure. we had legislated a payroll tax threshold lift on the 1st of January next year as a result of COVID. I emphasise again for your ears. Uh, Shadow Treasurer, as a result of COVID, we brought that forward to the 1st of July this year. Again, uh, I want to say 14 to 17,000 businesses benefited from that, uh, hence why they thank me and continue to thank me for that decision made by this government. Member for Burns Beach. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the decisive action taken by the state government in responding to the recent outbreak of COVID-19 in South Australia, and I ask, can the minister update the House on the measures being undertaken to ensure that our hotel quarantine processes remain strong and outline any other measures that are being implemented to ensure West Australians are being kept safe and strong? Thank you. Minister for Health. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Burns Beach for the question. It's an important one because we know that decisive and speedy response and decision making is, is absolutely vital for getting any outbreak of this disease under control. And Mr Speaker, the McGowan government's response has been that. It's been decisive, it was rapid and, um, and it is focused on keeping Western Australians safe and strong. And Mr Speaker, I want to just acknowledge the great work by all government agencies to respond to that call for the decisions by the government to make sure that we could put those changes in place that are necessary for keeping Western Australians safe. WA Health has been working closely with government agencies and airlines to prepare and manage the influx of arrivals into the state post the changes uh, to the border requirements, in particular to prevent the co-mingling between passengers from very low-risk states 
uh, and low risk states and medium risk states to ensure that the um, airport infection control processes are in place. WA nursing staff were boosted at the airport, Mr Speaker, to meet the demands of increased passenger arrivals and passengers are required to complete a uh, health declaration via the, the G2G app and undergo airport health screens, including temperature checks. Uh, Mr Speaker, all passengers with an elevated temperature that is of 37.5 degrees and above will be offered a COVID-19 test at the airport clinic. Anyone who is symptomatic and has a COVID test at the airport will be required to go straight home and isolate until they receive their results. To date, Mr Speaker, there has been 521,971 COVID-19 tests performed in WA, 112,000 of those, Mr Speaker, in regional WA. And WA uh, Health has contacted exempt travellers for over 22 weeks now, offering daily monitoring. And Mr Speaker, this, the, the, the uh, series of actions or the unfolding situation in South Australia obviously makes us reflect strongly upon the arrangements in our, in our hotel quarantining arrangements. Indeed, um, the hotel quarantine arrangements in WA are under intense oversight by the SHIC representatives. We, we examine all potential incidents and breaches by hotel management and security management with immediate investigation and rectification if that has occurred. Regular meetings are held with hotel and security management. Regular audits are conducted by infection prevention and control, including staff training for security workers and hotel staff. Strong compliance with infection control and PPE use of all agencies is involved. And Mr Speaker, the situation in South Australia gives us cause to reflect in relation to those, and as a result, of the situation there. We are extending our Detect Borders program, our voluntary uh, uh, testing program for all our uh, border um, uh, workers, healthcare, security and the like, to now transition to a mandatory testing of all high-risk high workers, similar to the, uh, um, to the transport and logistics uh, testing regime, which is a seven-day rolling testing arrangement for our um, high-risk hotel workers. These are all important measures, Mr Speaker. They're there for a reason. They're there to keep Western Australians safe. Department of Health has done an outstanding job in making sure that we continue to, uh, to keep an eye on our hotel arrangements and all other border arrangements, and they've done West Australians proud, Mr Speaker, and we're very pleased with the work that's been done. Uh, the leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the failed primary industries workers' regional travel and support scheme, which, as of yesterday, had only approved 90 of just 345 applications for travel and accommodation reimbursements. And I ask, with the tightening of border controls between South Australia and Western Australia, and the possible risk of outbreaks elsewhere. What options will your government pursue to ensure the agricultural, pastoral, horticultural sector has access to the 7,000 essential workers they require? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, obviously, as I've, I've answered broadly this question many times, um, we have closed international borders by the Commonwealth Government, which I support. Um, we have uh, controlled borders with most states in the east and a hard border of South Australia or people transiting through South Australia. Uh, if, uh, if agricultural workers wish to apply for a G2G pass, uh, they can come from Queensland, uh, the ACT, uh, Tasmania or the Northern Territory right now uh, to Western Australia, subject to a health check uh, upon arrival, Mr Speaker. If they wish to come from New South Wales or Victoria, they can come to Western Australia now, subject to two weeks quarantine and uh, mandatory testing, Mr Speaker. That is the current situation. So, with the exception of South Australia or people going through South Australia, they can still get here subject to the appropriate testing and quarantine arrangements, in particular from the two biggest jurisdictions, which is New South Wales uh, or Victoria, Mr Speaker. Uh, that's the arrangement. Uh, in terms of the um, arrangement we put in place to assist people go out and work, that was uh, something I think that was Australia leading. Um, $4,000 potentially to go and work in agriculture. I'd urge agricultural organisations to promote it to Western Australians, to get out there and uh, take advantage of the opportunities and the funding uh, that is available. Obviously, we have to put in place appropriate checks and balances to make sure that people don't exploit or abuse the system. And what you often find is uh, you know, people who go and do agricultural work, uh, sometimes it is not what they expected. 
And uh, if they go out there for one day, obviously we're not expect, we don't expect the state to pay them $4,000. It's not what they thought it would be. So uh, we all know it's, it can be difficult and hard. Um, so that's the arrangement. Obviously, um, we continue to look at um, uh, the issue of Vanuatu, uh, which other states are taking up. Uh, Vanuatu is uh, largely COVID-free. Uh, in fact, it is COVID-free, is my understanding. And um, uh, we're looking at whether or not uh, we can work uh, on uh, a, a number of agricultural workers coming uh, from that jurisdiction to Western Australia, subject to quarantining uh, and COVID testing. Supplementary, Mr Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Premier. Premier, will you consider convening a regional labour task Labor Task Force to respond to this growing crisis, impacting the productivity and safety of these vital industries, both now and in the coming months? And if not, why not? Mr Speaker, we'll continue to work with uh, agricultural industries, and the Agriculture Minister uh, meets with, regularly with um, uh, various organisations, uh, whether it's West Australian Farmers Federation or Vegetables WA, we continue to work on these things. Uh, I'm not sure another committee uh, is the solution. It is regularly proposed by the National Party to set up more committees, um, but uh, we're more about action than committee. Member for Kalamunda. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's efforts in supporting our economic recovery through its record investment in road projects across WA. And I ask, can the minister update the House on the delivery of this government's record pipeline of road projects and outline how this investment is supporting local WA jobs and local WA businesses? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, and I thank the member for Kalamunda for that question. And of course, spending on transport projects and road projects has been a priority of this government. A record number of projects, a record number of contracts and a record number of companies out there supporting WA workers and creating certainty for, w for the WA employment market. We invested over $1.2 billion in road projects last year and $1.4 billion in the current year. I just want to give you a bit of a snapshot of how we compare to the previous government. Under the previous government's expectations, in 2018-19, they would spend $192 million on road spending in regional WA. We have spent $628 million in the same year, members. In 1920, their forecast showed $139 million being spent on regional road projects, but we spent $653 million on regional road projects, supporting uh, regional communities, regional road safety and, of course, regional employment. And I also think it's good to look back at some of the projects that we've completed already as part of our commitment to Western Australia. And many may remember when we renegotiated the Perth Freightlink money Remember, to our priority projects, something the, the former government said couldn't be done, that the Liberal Party said couldn't be done, we renegotiated, and look what we've delivered. The duelling of Wanneroo Road, member for Wanneroo, June Lup Drive to Flynn Drive. The Wanneroo Road, Ocean Reef Road interchange, done. The Wanneroo Road, June Lup Drive interchange will be completed in the next month. The Reed Highway dual carriageway, completed. The Mitchell Freeway southbound widening, um, completed. The Quinanda Freeway southbound on-ramp on at Manning Road, member for South Perth. The Johnny McGrath on-ramp, completed. The great, one of my greatest achievements. Oh, your, sorry, yeah, sorry, this member for South Perth, greatest. The Murdoch Drive connection, completed. The Kunanda Freeway northbound widening, Russell Road to Highway, completed. Smart Freeway members, completed. Completed. Armadale Road upgrade, the duplication, Anstey to Tampa, completed. The Row Highway, Kalamunda Road um, inter uh, intersection upgrade, on its way, on its way. The Carroll Avenue up upgrades will be completed soon. The Armadale Road to North Bro Lake Bridge, over a $200 million project, well underway. And of course, High Street, also underway. And of course, there's so much more going on in Bunbury, the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, the Albany Ring Road, um, of course, the Carratha Tom Price Manuara Red Dog Highway, um, Stage 3 completed, South Coast Highway. Members, there has been so much work undertaken, so much work underway, but there's so much more to be done. And this is about supporting West Australia's economic recovery, about supporting WA workers and making sure there's a pipeline of investment, a pipeline of work for Western Australia for years to come. 
Member for Dawes, uh, my, sorry, the Member for Churchland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Corrective Services. Uh, Minister, I refer to the current Corruption and Crime Commission public examinations into how culture contributes to serious misconduct in Hakea and other prisons in Western Australia, and I ask, given that you were warned of corruption concerns in the Triple C's report into misconduct risks in WA prisons in 2018, why are we still reading about corruption and misconduct concerns in the prison system after four years of the McGowan Labor government? Thank you, Mr Speaker, Minister. and uh, thank the member for raising this issue. Um, it is a very important issue, and as the member would remember himself, that those matters that were raised by the Crime and Corruption Commission reports, and there were a number of them, related primarily to uh, actions that occurred under the previous Liberal National Government. And the recommendations from those reports, which the Triple C themselves have already uh, uh, reported on, most of those recommendations have been implemented, and we were congratulated as a government and as a department for moving so quickly on those recommendations. This current investigation that has been undertaken by the Triple C, if you would go to the website of the Triple C and read the four page document that it, re that it relates to, the investigation that it relates to, it relates to an incident that occurred. To, uh, in 2018 at Hakea Prison. It doesn't go back to the issues that they, were, they had reported on that you are trying to allude to. It relates to a particular incident that, that, that occurred in 2018. I'm not going to make any comment whatsoever about that issue because it's under investigation as it should be, and I look forward to hearing, uh, reading the report. Supplementary. Uh, Minister. Are you saying that there are no corruption and misconduct concerns by the McGowan Labor government in our current prison system? Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Acting Speaker. I will, what I will point out to you, what I will, what I will point out to you, uh, Member for Churchlands, is the fact that the McGowan Labor government and myself, as the Minister for Corrections, have put in place things that you could only dream about yeah. in government, That's that right. you could only dream about. Well, you certainly well, didn't yes. take the sir. issue, Mr Two Acting years. Speaker, you certainly didn't take the issue of corruption and the smuggling of contraband into prisons seriously. And that was clearly set out in the Triple C reports. It is Labor in government acting on the Triple C reports that's put the Professional Standards Division in place. And can I just once again, for your benefit, report on what the PSD have done. In the 2018, uh, between 2018 and 2019, there were 792 misconduct cases that were investigated by the, by the PSD. They, they have, within their division, 51 staff and two WA police detectives. Of those investigations, 121 were referred for assessment and investigation by the Integrity and Accountability Directorate. 41 were referred to the police team. 78 were retained for intelligence purposes. Of the remaining 552 cases which were dealt by misconduct assessment unit, 25 resulted in improvement action. 35 were referred to the third to third party contracted providers, such as Broad Spectrum Acacia. 225 were referred to local management action by prison superintendents and other executive ma managers. Three were referred to access the internal prisoner complaint system. Two were referred, uh, referred to be dealt with by the public service staff, and 262 resulted in no further action. May I also add that the, the, PSD, the PSD has delivered, has delivered anti-corruption and integrity session, sessions to 70, 733 staff in its first year of operation. Do not come into this House trying to make allegations against the McGowan government and against the Department of Justice that we haven't been doing anything about clamping down on corruption and contraband. We've done more than you could possibly even dream about when you're in government. Thank you for that quick answer, Minister. Thank you. Uh, the member for Kimberley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. 
I refer to the McGowan Labor government's support for self-determination by Aboriginal people. And I ask, Minister, can you upgrade the House on this government's achievements in settling native title claims across the state? And outline how these determinations support the recent NAIDOC week theme of always was and always will be. Mr Speaker, can I thank the member for Kimberley for her question. And Mr Speaker, it wasn't that long ago that the, uh, the theme of this year's NAIDOC always was, always will be, really was a protest chant. Uh, by uh, Aboriginal people uh, uh, advocating for their rights and is now uh, made broadly accepted across Western Australia. And, uh, native title and double, as, as I've wanted to do over the last uh, nearly four years, is update the House on the progress of native title claims in the previous 12 months. And native title really is a Western Australian story, even though it's a Commonwealth Act, uh, WA being the only state not to have a separate land rights regime. A native title has been the dominant um, uh, uh, native, effectively, title regime for Aboriginal people uh, in Western Australia. And uh, of all exclusive possession native title, member for Kimberley, 95% uh, of it is in Western Australia, in the Kimberley region in particular. Uh, and I want to point out uh, native title now has created, over the last 20 years in particular, an architecture uh, around the state of prescribed bodies, corporate and representative bodies that are now a permanent part of uh, the environment in which government and the private sector operates. Uh, as at the 17th of November, a total of 1,893,000 square kilometres of Western Australia is covered by native title determinations. That's 75% of the state, and the point I make being we are the native title state. Uh, of that 1.8 million square kilometres, a third of that has been effectively determined in the last four years. There has been a real ramp up in native title determinations under this, under this government, and we've done that by and large by consent. There has been a, a lot of effort to go into ensuring that these aren't decided by the court, but decided by agreement. And noting that now native title, we're well over halfway in respect of native title, so we are dealing actually with the tougher native title uh, claims, uh, but by the fact that out of the 53 determinations in the last four years, nearly four years, 46 have been made by consent, and the Kimberley highlight the success that we've had, and that has delivered uh, just over 617,000 square kilometres uh, of recognised native title. Uh, importantly, we do actually, we have now, hopefully very, very soon, uh, a resolution of the uh, Noongar settlement uh, that, has, that has been going on for a long period of time, Mr Speaker. This, uh, the High Court next week, on the 26th of November, uh, is, due to make, is due to hear the special leave appeal. Uh, this goes back to the Noongar decision of September 2006, to give the, uh, the Chamber some idea of how long this has been going on through the court process. Hopefully the objections that were uh, lodged uh, when the previous government uh, struck that agreement with the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council will <coughs> finally be resolved next week and we can uh, move forward with uh, what still stands as uh, Australia's largest and most significant native title agreement between a state government and a, uh, and a body of Aboriginal people. Uh, I know the, the Noongar people in particular have been frustrated by this long, uh, uh, long delay through litigation but I'm confident that we are nearly there and everybody in this place hopefully can very shortly celebrate the final conclusion and therefore the registration of those six Indigenous land use agreements that make up the Noongar settlement. Thank you, Speaker. Member. Member for Rowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to reports of roof collapse at Headland Senior High School in Port Headland, which, as you know, is the powerhouse of the WA economy and the source of much income for the State Government, and I ask, Premier, you've had four years to address major safety issues, leaving staff and students at risk. When will you actually commit to rebuilding the school instead of these patch-up jobs? Premier. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I understand that there was uh, some trouble with one of the ceilings uh, in uh, one of the buildings at uh, Port Hedland High School. Uh, it, I'm trying to recall the exact details, but it may well have been a gym. Uh, and uh, from memory, it was uh, from memory. It was on an occasion when the students were not present, uh, and there was repair work being done. 
Uh, the government has uh, allocated from memory again $18 million uh, for significant improvements to Headland High School, which is a very significant amount of money. Uh, that builds on our $40 million for the new Robin High School uh, and uh, around $20 million uh, or thereabouts, maybe 25 to expand uh, Karratha Senior High School. Uh, and uh, then as well, as we know, new uh, hospital in uh, Newman, Mr Speaker, new marina in Headland, Karratha Tom Price Road, the list goes on across the Pilbara, Mr Speaker. Uh, obviously a very significant investment by this government uh, in uh, Headland High that I'm sure will continue to, to, to ensure that the students of Headland uh, receive the very best of education. Thank you, Premier. Supplementary. Premier. You can commit $60 million towards a new secondary school in PR awarders. When will staff and students in Port Hedland be given a new school that they can safely attend? Mem members, members. I think the Premier can answer this question on his Mr. Own. Speaker, Premier. it's an embarrassing line of argument, and you engage in this a lot. I mean, Piara Waters in the southern suburbs there is massively expanding. There's not enough places in the existing schools for students. So you have to build a new high school. That's what happens. Both governments have done that. When your predecessor was in the former government, that happened. And we do that. Yet you come, the National Party comes in here and tries to say that you know, kids in a certain geographical area should have to go to massively overcrowded schools. That's your argument. It's a, it's a sort of a, a, a sectarianism that the National Party consistently engages in, and it's divisive and it's nasty. I just outlined to you, but yet again you did not listen. We're building a new high school in Robin. Robin. You know, you, you know where Robin is? Robin, Mr Speaker. We're building, we're, re, we're, we're expanding uh, Karratha High School because the number of students is growing. And that's what you do. You have to expand it. We're spending $25 million or thereabouts on that high school. And when it comes to Headland High School, $18 million. During the term of the last government, nothing was spent on Headland High School. Nothing was spent on Headland High School. And here we are doing that, and you come in here and attack a group of kids down in Piara Waters. Yeah. I mean, the National Party, Mr Speaker, the way you act and the way you conduct yourself and this sort of divisiveness where now you're actually attacking a group of kids is frankly disgusting. Yeah. Member for Mount Lawley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Energy. Can the Minister outline to the House how the McGowan Labor Government is supporting small businesses across Western Australia, particularly as the economy recovers from COVID-19? And can the Minister advise the House if he is aware of any risks to these businesses that would burden them with high electricity costs? Mr. Speaker, Premier, uh, sorry, <laughs> Minister, thank you very much. <laughs> no, I'm very happy being Minister for Energy. I wish to. Um, uh, uh, member, I can absolutely update you on that. I just want to remind everybody that uh, the McGowan Labor government supported small businesses in Western Australia who were customers of Synergy and Horizon and uh, and charities as well, with a two and a half thousand dollar offset to their electricity costs. I remind you of that. Now, the average electricity bill for those businesses in Western Australia is $2,800. So effectively, uh, nine or ten months of the average bill for people, uh, for Synergy and Horizon customers was paid by uh, the government of Western Australia. And of course, it wasn't just uh, uh, businesses that were being supported. Of course, the $600 uh, offset for every West Australian uh, who are customers of Synergy and Horizon, uh, also a big support. And for those people who are pensioners and on uh, healthcare cards, we doubled the energy assistance payment, meaning that for those people, $1,400, or nearly $1,400 of their electricity bill is being paid for by the McGowan government, which is, for many of those people, more than a free year of electricity. Yeah. So it just shows you that this government is deeply committed to supporting people uh, in Western Australia. And it's interesting, there are risks to the future uh, costs of electricity. Here in Western Australia, the average uh, retail margin for electricity is, is barely 2%. And interestingly, in Victoria, it's well over 6%. In New South Wales, it's 
So to actually examine not just the outright price of electricity, but the makeup of electricity costs, because of course, like Tasmania is a low cost jurisdiction because it's very small and relies 100% on renewable energy compared to a high cost jurisdiction like South Australia, which is of course more expensive than Western Australia. But look at the components. So the profit margins for those companies in those states are higher than the profit margins here in Western Australia. That means that the underlying costs don't benefit the consumers, they benefit the companies that sell electricity. And that's what we've seen on the East Coast, that every time there's been any alleged benefits from reform on the East Coast, it doesn't go to consumers, it goes to the investors in electricity companies. Investors right. in electricity companies through higher profits. That's right. And isn't it interesting, one of the electricity companies that operates here in Western Australia was privatised by the Liberal Party. Oh, yeah. Privatised yeah. by the Liberal Party and is now owned by foreign interests. Oh, isn't yeah. that interesting? That's what happens. What do we say about the electricity system here in Western Australia? It's one of the things we say is the Liberal Party have a fetish for privatisation. Yeah. And when you privatise, yeah. prices go up yeah. and they're bought by foreign <laughs> interests. Members. We said at the last election we, we made it clear that we Members. would keep Western Power, Synergy and Horizon in public ownership and we've delivered. The Liberal Party said that they wanted to privatise those businesses just like they did with Alinta. And I remind people, they sold Alinta and now it's owned by foreign interests. That's right. A member for Darling Range. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, given the economic impact of COVID-19, including the latest outbreak in South Australia, I ask, will you provide a grant of up to $10,000 like... Oh. Members, members, please, I, I want to hear this. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will you provide a grant of up to $10,000 like other states have done to assist those small businesses that continue to suffer, suffer substantial financial harm from the COVID-19 crisis to assist them to survive, rebuild and save jobs. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this is the same question that the Liberal Party has now asked on numerous occasions. We are now in the final sitting week of Parliament before the state election. I just ask, is that the Liberal Party's policy to provide 100,000 100,000 grants of $10,000. Is that your policy? That's not what I said. <laughs> oh. My mistake, Mr Speaker. The Minister for Small Business just advised me there's 226,000 businesses classed as small businesses in WA. Is it your policy to give them all $10,000, as you have committed to in press releases you put out? Is that, does that remain your policy? Does that remain your policy? Because I'll tell you what, Mr Speaker, the Treasurer might be retiring, but he's still active. And he'll be adding this up, Mr Speaker, in the lead up to March, so the people of Western Australia understand exactly exactly what the Liberal Party is going to do to this state's finances should you be elected. Look at New South Wales, Mr Speaker. Look at New South Wales. Liberal government, Mr Speaker. $16 billion deficit, Mr Speaker. $16 billion deficit today. That's what's come out of a Liberal government over there. They privatised all the assets, Mr Speaker. They privatised and sold everything, Mr Speaker, on the basis that would secure the state's future. What happens now? $16 billion deficits, Mr Speaker. And we deliver, this government delivers, surpluses, Mr Speaker. This government delivers surpluses, so this, state, so, this state is, so this state is kept safe and secure for the future, Mr Speaker. That's the difference. That's the difference. We have people who actually understand proper management of the state. The Liberal Party does not, and the tone of that question shows that you don't. Now, the economy in Western Australia is going the best of anywhere in Australia. The best of anywhere in Australia. By a long, long way, Mr Speaker. By a long, long way. We now have the lowest unemployment rate in Australia. We have the highest participation rate in Australia. We have a state government in surplus, Mr Speaker. A state government are in surplus, Mr Speaker. Whether it's housing, whether it's construction, whether it's mining, hospitality, retail, 
Western Australia is leading the nation, Mr Speaker. We're investing more in training to train West Australians, Mr Speaker, to take up those numerous job opportunities that are out there. And all we hear from the Liberal Party is they want to bankrupt the state. That's all we hear from you. Let the Liberal Party's view is, let's just go and bankrupt Western Australia. That appears to be your policy. And, and Mr Speaker, don't worry, we have your press releases that prove it, Mr Speaker. So, so Mr Speaker, the choice is very clear for West Australians. A government that is keeping Western Australia safe and strong versus a mob that would have let COVID back in and would bankrupt this state. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Premier, do you acknowledge that there are a number of small businesses that are carrying the fight? Will you stop interrupting and bullying? It's nearly Christmas. <laughs> Minister for Transport, you're the only person to be called to order today. <laughs> Member for Darling Range. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So far. Premier, do you acknowledge that there are a number of small businesses that are carrying the financial burden of COVID-19 crisis? Two more. Two more. Don't they deserve financial assistance? And why don't they have your support? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Premier, we handed out the budget last month. Last month. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, you might have noted, we, we froze fees and charges for yeah, West yeah. Australians, Mr Speaker. Sorry. We froze fees and charges. You might have also noticed, Mr Speaker, we gave every household, based upon a one-off windfall that we secured, the bell payment, Mr Speaker, we gave every... We gave every household $600. Every household $600 off their electricity bill. I note the New South Wales government is giving people $100 vouchers to go and buy a meal, Mr. Speaker, which is completely debt funded. Completely debt funded, Mr. Speaker. Whereas this state, whereas this state, Mr. Speaker, we received a windfall of over $600 million, and we are giving it back to every electricity consumer across the state in a $600 grant on their synergy bill, Mr Speaker. Then, earlier this year, as part of our initial response to COVID, we gave every business across the state, every small business across the state, on the synergy tariff, Mr Speaker, $2,500 credit on their electricity bill. When it comes to tourism businesses, we did a full analysis of those businesses that were suffering, particularly those that relied upon international interstate tourists, and we gave them financial support, Mr Speaker, as part of the $15 million or so package the Tourism Minister put together. And then on top of that, Mr Speaker, only Government Australia, we went to the travel agents and we said, we said to the travel agents, how can we help? And we gave travel agents across the state grants of up to or, or above $10,000 each, Mr Speaker. Other governments across Australia have not done that, Mr Speaker. So the Liberal Party's policy is like a, um, it's like a blunderbuss, Mr Speaker. Fire it everywhere. Give businesses that may not need it $10,000. Bankrupt the state, as you did once before, and let COVID back in. That's their policy, Mr Speaker. That's your policy. Well, Mr Speaker, don't worry. We'll make sure West Australians understand what you stand for every day of the week between now and March. Member for Morley. My question is to the Minister for the Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's significant investment in services and initiatives to support victims of family and domestic violence. And I ask, can the minister update the House on how this government's unprecedented investment in services and its record legislative reform are helping to protect vulnerable West Australians, particularly as we cover for, recover from COVID-19? Mr Speaker, minister. I'd like to thank the member for this question and also for her ongoing support and interest in addressing these complex issues. And unfortunately, um, as too many uh, members here would know, uh, in, it was only two years ago that you had a um, member. You had a um, horror family homicide in your electorate, uh, and that was a terrible year of, uh, of family-related um, uh, violence in this state. There is a lot to do, as we've said many times, and I'm looking forward in next week, November 25, to mark the beginning of our annual campaign, 16 Days in, in WA, to stop violence against women. We've been running that campaign since we came to government, 2017, and it is about drawing attention to the many impacts of violence against women uh, and what we can all do to make sure that, uh, that we uh, play a role in, in stopping that violence. 
If women and children are not safe in their homes, in their most trusted relationships, in their workplaces and online, then the impacts can be severe. One in five women in WA report having experienced partner violence since the age of 15. One in five. That is the highest figure um, in, in the country. WA has the highest figure in the country. Um, there's no mistaking this problem for our state. That's why 16 Days in WA is such an important campaign. It is about encouraging leaders, whether they be state, regional or local, from all sectors, from all industries, to be part of the conversation about what we can all do, what we can all do individually and collectively to end violence against women. The campaign is about changing the conditions that allow victim blaming to occur. Unfortunately, views such as why doesn't she just leave or she must have provoked him um, can stop survivors coming forward for help and support and unfortunately is still prevalent in our society. Mr Speaker, the McGowan government action and investment in prevention of domestic violence uh, is clear. I'm proud to say when it comes to providing help and support to respond to and to reduce domestic violence, our government in record, our government's record speaks for itself. We've responded with practical support and assistance to victims. Prior to COVID, we had uh, committed over $53 million of additional funding to new measures, including two new women's refuges, establishing two one-stop family domestic hubs, introducing Pets in Crisis a program with RSPCA, setting up family and domestic violence screening during pregnancy checks, training for police officers in domestic violence, reinstating funding for, family, um, for financial counselling services and establishing a second residential men's behaviour change program known as Breathing Space. In July, as a result of COVID, we announced a number of additional measures to deliver increased support to the tune of around $23 million as part of our recovery plan to keep the state safe and strong. And that includes additional uh, domestic violence outreach workers in refuges around the state, $8.6 million, uh, $6.7 million to bolster the 17 family and domestic violence response teams, additional community people uh, placed within those response teams, uh, over $100,000 to go to job retraining pilot for women in refuges, and over $1 million for two years of counselling, advocacy and support services. And we've also boosted the, um, the capacity of the new refuges, so there will be an additional $4 million to increase, I think double the number of uh, families that will be able to be supported through those refuges. And of course, with the assistance of the uh, Attorney General, we've got extensive family violence law reform which includes the new criminal offences of suffocation, strangulation and persistent family violence, improving access to restraining orders, including being able to lodge those applications online, enabling the court to declare a person a serial family violence offender. This declaration, is the first, a de declaration of this kind is the first in Australia, and trialling a GPS tracking system for family and domestic violence offenders. The two-year trial in involves GPS tracking of up to 100 high-risk offenders who have breached a family violence restraining order and committed a further act of violence. And finally, um, uh, Mr Speaker, we have already changed the Residential Tenancies Act to better meet the needs of tenants who are survivors of family and domestic violence. They can now choose to stay or leave their tenancies and, if needed, make their rental homes safer, including lock changes and other security upgrades. When it comes to stopping family violence, there is always more to be done, but I am proud to be part of the McGowan Labor government who takes this issue seriously and has followed up that commitment with concrete action for reform. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, will you provide a timeline on when P2 and N95 fit testing of those months? Sorry, start again. Will you provide a timeline to the House as to when P2 and N95 fit testing? Uh, will be undertaken for our hospital staff uh, in Western Australia. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the, the fit testing um, uh, commitment is a commitment we made some time ago in conjunction with the healthcare workers' uh, uh, representatives or, their, or the health unions. 
And, Mr Speaker, the, the fit testing regime is one that we are committed to. Uh, some states have already got it in place, others continue to, um, to roll it out as part of their overall response. I have to say, Mr Speaker, that safety of our staff is our, is our, single, big, is our single biggest priority when it comes to making sure that we keep our healthcare workers safe, particularly during a time of COVID-19. All WA healthcare workers are provided with PPE uh, to make sure that they, ha they can protect themselves and to make sure that they can protect their, their patients, particularly in high risk situations, for example, aerosol generating procedures which require higher grade masks. Those masks, uh, however, Mr Speaker, should be tested on individuals to ensure that it's a satisfactory fit um, to their face. Uh, and this requires a 30-minute uh, fit testing procedure, which requires specialised equipment and um, trained staff. The equipment has been purchased, uh, member, and trainers are currently being identified and are undertaking that training. And, and obviously uh, that training will continue and, um, and with a view to rolling out the testing to high risk areas in the first instance. A uh, sustainable program of testing which is compliant with international standards has been designed and we'll try to make that sure that gets going as soon as possible. Um, I've asked the department to see if they can speed up that process because we understand that it is uh, uh, an area of concern. I should just say, Mr Speaker, that throughout our entire experience of COVID-19, not one healthcare worker has contracted COVID-19 in a clinical context, that is from their place of work, which is an outstanding result. This includes, Mr Speaker, the healthcare workers at Joondalup Hospital who had to um, care for the Artania patients, many of whom were very sick indeed, and, um, and obviously occupied many of the beds at that hospital. Mr Speaker, all those staff have since been serology tested, so even if we know that even if they um, were uh, asymptomatic, uh, the lack of presence of any antibodies in their systems uh, indicates that there was no transmission of the disease at all. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take uh, extra precautions, Mr Speaker. The fit testing regime, which the department has designed and is committed to, will, along with the McGowan government, is obviously an important next step, and we'll roll it out as soon as possible. Thank you. Supplementary, Supplementary. I, I appreciate the Minister's commitment to the safety of our frontline healthcare workers, and the Liberal Party stand with you in doing so. Minister, given most jurisdictions have rolled out fit testing for those masks in our frontline hospitals around Australia, why is Western Australia still behind? And can you provide a date to this House when the frontline and high risk healthcare workers here will get the fit testing of those masks that they deserve? Minister. Oh, Mr. Speaker, we heard from the Premier earlier who, um, who talked about exemplary behaviours from oppositions, uh, particularly the South Australian opposition, who this week wrote to the Premier in that state to suggest that they should suspend estimates in that state because they wanted to make sure the government was committed to the, to the single task of examining COVID. The, the, uh, the tactics of this opposition stands in stark contrast to that. Stark contrast. Uh, member, uh, and you, you come to this place and you make these statements like, every other state has done this, why haven't you, to suggest that somehow Western Australia is behind. It is simply not the case. Some states have been doing this as a matter of course, other Remember states are doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, for instance, Remember ourselves in Queensland are in the process again. of. of are in the process of, of implementing this program. We're doing it in conjunction with the healthcare unions. We're doing it with their support. To come to this place, Mr Speaker, once again to try to undermine the government's efforts to protect our frontline workers uh, really does no credit to the opposition. Yeah. That's the end of question, I members. Uh, I present for table in the eighth report of the Procedure and Privileges Committee entitled The Legislative Assembly's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic.